see a good number of people have joined us. So let's start. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this webinar, Understanding the Crisis in Tigray, a panel discussion. My name is uh, uh, Flavia Gasbarri. I am a lecturer in the World Studies Department at King's College London, and I am the co-chair of the Africa Research Group, which has organized this event. So welcome. Today's event is, of course, about the current crisis in Tigray, a discussion to try to understand what is going on, what are the causes of this crisis, and how the situation may evolve in the next uh, future. We have three panelists, so we are going, of course, to first hear from them, and then uh, we will open the floor to uh, questions and comments from the uh, public. In this regard, please, uh, I would kindly ask you to post uh, your questions and comment on the Q&A uh, uh, chat that you can find at the bottom of the uh, screen. Don't use the chat function because this is not working for now. So just the Q&A, uh, just click on the Q&A and you can uh, post your comments and questions. So let's uh, move to our uh, speakers. I'm going to briefly introduce them in the order uh, in which they will uh, speak. Uh, starting with uh, Patrick uh, Gilks, who was an advisor, strategic planning in Ethiopia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 2004 up to uh, 2019. He previously worked as a senior research analyst on the Horn of Africa in the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 2002-2003. And uh, he also work, worked as a political consultant on the Horn of Africa for uh, different, for several international organizations. Um, he has broadcasted and written, uh, written extensively on Africa for magazines and newspapers, both in the UK and in the United uh, States. And he also worked for the BBC uh, World Service from 1974 uh, up to 1993, reporting on Africa, um, particularly on the Horn of Africa. Then we have our second speaker, who is Martin Plouth, who is a journalist and visiting fellow, a visiting senior fellow at the Department of World Studies at King's College. He has worked on Africa since the 80s, uh, particularly on the Horn of Africa and Southern Africa. He worked for many years for the BBC World Service. He reported from many parts of Africa, and he was appointed Africa editor for the BBC World Service News in 2003. He's also a member of the Royal Institute of African uh, Affairs at Chatham House, uh, and he has advised the British and the US uh, government in the past. And then our last uh, speaker, Silam Kidan, who is a systemic psychotherapist, a PhD candidate at the Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Her research focuses on trauma and collective trauma in post-conflict and crisis communities. Uh, she's also known for her work as a human rights activist. She's uh, the founding member and the, and the director of a human rights uh, charity, Release Eritrea, which is based here in the UK. So welcome to our panelists. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, so I leave, you, uh, leave the floor to our first speaker, uh, Patrick. Thank you very much. I hope I'm now audible. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kasparri. Thank you very much for that introduction and for this opportunity. Now, there are a number of ways of looking at the crisis in Tigray and the conflict that's been taking place there over the last few months. The origins of it, the present situation, different narratives that have been uh, created about it, ranging from the federal government of Ethiopia's law enforcement operation to the TPLF's genocidal civil war, all understandably partial, to put it politely, and difficult to follow because of the constraints against journalistic activity and the overall lack of transparency. And in that context, I think it's worth emphasizing that social media is not a satisfactory alternative. But all these narratives <coughs> and the reality of what's actually happening on the ground do rest on existing elements in, in, in the Ethiopian polity. And I want to look first briefly at the historic origins of some of these, and then perhaps at the current future implications for the region, 
which again are, are very much rooted in the past. I'm going to largely ignore the current situations. I think others are going to cover that. Now, at one level, all this goes back over two centuries to the time of the Zemen Emesifet in the, between 1760s and 1850s, the era of the princes in Ethiopia, when for a hundred or more years, warlords fought for control of the imperial throne at Gonda. And at one stage in 1800, I think, there were actually six crowned emperors alive in different parts of the highlands, all supported by different warlords from the Amhara, Oromo and Tigrayan peoples. And it's these three peoples who've remained the central elements in the current problems of the state today. In the second half of the 19th century, effective imperial control was re-established by a Tigrayan, a Venishow and Amhara emperor. And it was the latter, Menelik II, famous for defeating the Italians at the Battle of Adowa in 1896, who also established the current, if still contested, boundaries of the country. Menelik was also responsible for largely including or re-including much of southern Ethiopia into the empire. And his methods are still remembered and not fondly in Oromo histories and by other peoples that were conquered at the time. And this is still something that is remembered and, it's, and that's important. People have not forgotten. In the last half century, Ethiopia has also gone through major changes of governance and ideology. These have ranged from, as it were, genuine imperial rule by Haile Selassie to a workers' party government. The last emperor, Haile Selassie, was overthrown in 1974 by a military coup. A committee of 100 or so junior officers and soldiers under the influence of student Marxists, whose leading quality perhaps was their inability to actually cooperate. The attempt to impose a socialist ideology failed. The military regime, the Derg, collapsed in 1991 under the pressure of its economic failure, the successful Eritrean liberation struggle for independence, and the activities of opposition groups, several of which were ethnically based, the leading one being the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Both the emperor and the Derg ran highly centralized regimes with little time for the peripheral lowland areas of the state. Both fought long and hard to keep Eritrea within Ethiopia. The Eritrean struggle for independence was uh, launched in 1961, and the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, headed by Asai Safawake, destroyed rival movements before eventually achieving its de facto independence in 1991, and de jure independence after the referendum in 93. The TPLF took power in Addis Ababa in 1991 as the leading and controlling element in an ethnically framed coalition, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. And that implemented an ethnically based constitution of nine states. In theory, the states are constitutionally equal, though in fact in, and in practice, the de Graham party, the TPLF, remained the controlling element of the ruling four-party coalition, the EPRDF. The others being the Amhara, parties representing the Amhara and the Oromo, and the party for the southern region, which actually covers officially, I think, 56 different nations, nationalities, and peoples. Now, the decision to, to base the constitution on ethnicity grew out of a belief of Tigrayans, Oromos, and other groups that under the previous regimes, the Amhara had predominated, marginalizing other groups. And many of these took up arms to oppose the military. And by 1991, there were actually numerous ethnically based armed groups that needed to be satisfied or dealt with. Equally, of course, ethnicity also provided a method to ensure continued Tigrayan control of the administration. And that was manifested most obviously in control of the electoral processes that took place in the 1990s and 2000s, and in the merging of the, the party in government and administration to, to the effect of actually controlling the situation. But it's worth noting that despite the concerns about this among other nationalities, and these concerns led to the, as it were, the overthrow of the TPLF in 2018, the concept of federalism has remained welcome to almost all the ethnic groups in the country. A central element, incidentally, in the 1995 constitution was Article 39, 
which provides for self-determination up to and including secession. There's actually little reason to believe the TPLF would ever have intended to implement this if it becomes a, it was drawn from the Soviet model. But for the critics of ethnic federalism and supporters of, of the idea of a more unified unitary state, it obviously appears to be something of a threatening option. Now the states after, 19, after 1991 were organized, the federal states were organized on the basis of language and ethnicity. But politics also played a major role and the results left numerous peoples and areas dissatisfied. Tigray regional state, for example, was expanded at the expense of the Amhara region. So uh, what was now, what has more, more recently been called Western Tigray was taken away from essentially from what had been Amhara control previously. It ex and this expanded the uh, uh, Tigray at the expense of the Amhara and allowed Tigray an international border with Sudan. This did not please the Amhara. And this partly explains the enthusiastic involvement of the Amhara militia in the recent operations in Tigray. And indeed, after 1995, the Amhara were left with claims on parts of Tigray, parts of Beni Shangul, Oromia, and Afar regions as well. The Oromos have claims on parts of the southern region uh, and along the interface with the Somali region. There are a total of around, I think it's 10 nationalities in the southern region that have expressed their interest in having their own regional state. One, the Sudama achieved the status last year. Under the constitution, having a regional state offers considerable economic benefits. It's worth mentioning too that, uh, of course, how long the constitution is going to actually last now is, is a question. Overall though, after 1995, as might be expected, if you like, there were numerous conflicts over land uh, and who should control it, and equally predictable perhaps in the circumstances, the Tigrayan controlled EPRDF turned more and more to repression under Prime Minister Meles, who became steadily more auto autocratic in the decade, decade before his death in 2012. And the result was growing opposition to the EPRDF and within the front to the TPLF and to the way it had manipulated and did manipulate the constitution. To be fair, there were some efforts at uh, trying to make reform in the uh, period after 2015, but Prime Minister Haile Mariam, who came from the southern region and succeeded Meles, was seen as a surrogate TPLF appointee and was unable to muster sufficient support from other parties in the EPRDF to implement any reform agenda or any serious reforms. This had to be left to Prime Minister Abe Ahmed, who come, was from the Oromo region, who took over as Prime Minister in April 2018 after Haile Mariam resigned a, a month earlier. Now, Abe was chosen as Prime Minister on the basis of a tactical alliance with the Oromo and Amhara parties within the EPRDF. It was driven by the failure of the EPRDF to provide any satisfactory response to the widespread Oromo unrest that broke out in 2015 and to the concerns, widespread concerns over corruption and incompetence and violence, economic failings, and if you like, the TPLF's disdain for democracy. The Amhara and the Oromo parties, and most of the Southern Party as well, certainly agreed on the need for reform and the removal of the TPLF from control of government, and even on the need for an Oromo to take office. But they did have very different views of the future. Many Amhara, who see themselves as having been the main victims of Tigrayan rule, identify ethnic federalism as the basic problem of governance and look much more to unified structures and greater central control. They support the uh, creation of Abbey's single national prosperity party in 2019. And Aromos and Southerners, and in general, almost all other ethnic groups, want more effective implementation of a federalism undistorted by TPLF control. And this remains the basic division, underlined, if you like, by what Oromo parties now see as a political shift by Abbey. He had their original support in 2018. They now regard him as having moved away from his Oromo supports to support Ethiopia when it, Ethiopianness, a unified rather than a devolved polity. 
Now, if I've got time, I want very briefly to, to drop that and, and look a little bit more at a look at uh, external issues of foreign policy, because central to Abbey's policies towards the TPLF and Tigray and the implementation of his law enforcement has been his alliance with President Osiris of Eritrea. That's a major development in Ethiopian foreign policy after 20 years of no war, no peace between the two nations. And it's also involved a number of other significant policy changes for Ethiopia's foreign policy of the region. And some of them also appear to pose threats to regional security, I think. Abe made his visit, historic visit to Asmara and signed a peace accord with the Sires in July 2018. <laughs> and that was widely welcomed, not least by Tigrayans who live on both sides of the border and make up 50% of the population of Eritrea. It also earned Abbey the Nobel Peace Prize, of course, in 2019. Now, the original accord was later elaborated, if only slightly, in, uh, a couple of months later, at the formal signing of a peace agreement in Riyadh, under the auspices of the Saudi Arabians and the UAE, both of which essentially funded the peace deal. And it's worth mentioning that the accord and the agreement offered very little apart from generalities and no details of what the two leaders agreed on have ever been made public or elaborated. It's also worth emphasizing, I think, that the agreement of, uh, and the whole deal with, with uh, Eritrea um, was done without actually talking to the Tigrayans, to the TPLF. And a large part of the Ethiopian border of Eritrea is actually fronted by Tigray. And the TPLF had major concerns about any agreement uh, with Osias, because Osias has often made it clear over the last 20 years, his wish, his determination to destroy the TPLF. And inevitably the TPLF has been nervous of, of Osias' intentions. This was actually underlined almost immediately after the agreement was signed when Osiris visited the Amhara state, which was already making claims against some of Tigray's lands. And that visit produced, I think, quite genuine fears of encirclement in Tigray, Eritrea to the north, Amhara region to the south. And it seems clear in retrospect that Osiris and Abbey probably agreed, either in 2018 or certainly shortly afterwards, that they would cooperate in dealing with the TPLF. Abbey was concerned that the TPLF was plotting a comeback there was an attempted assassination in July 2018, which was blamed on the former Degrand Director of Security, Katachu Asifa. And the hand of the TPLF was being seen in many other government problems. And Asias regarded the TPLF as the architect of the humiliation he had suffered at being defeated in the 1998-2000 war, and of the later sanctions on Eritrea, his virtual isolation after 2007. And the agreement, in 2018 provided a way out of the US sanctions and to open up Ethiopia's isolation, not that that was ever very effective, but also provided a way to influence and even balance to some degree Ethiopia's regional aspirations. Uh, and um, the, um, so from that point of view, both Abbey and Osiris were clearly in agreement that something needed to be done about the TPLF. Another series, major series of developments arising out of the agreement, uh, and these have already involved wider changes in Ethiopia's foreign policy, in particular relate to the regional organization, the EGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority for Development. Osiris walked out of EGAD in 2007 and refused to rejoin the organization because he regarded it as an instrument to provide for Ethiopian hegemonic claims in the region and therefore threatening to Eritrea. Ethiopia, in fact, retained the chair of EGAD between 2007 until 2019, despite the fact the chair was supposed to change annually. Osiris is actually opposed to organizations which he regards as limiting Eritrea's freedom of operation. But he moved quickly after 2018 to draw Abbey into creation, to joining in the creation of a Horn of Africa Council, uh, which has now been described as an Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia axis. And he appears to see this as a future alternative to EGAD. 
and indeed Eritrea, Ethiopia and Somalia are now working to bring South Sudan into the council. Um, Abe is a strong advocate of regional peace and integration, as he underlines in his book Medema, which um, is interesting reading if you want to find out what his philosophy of governance is. And he welcomed the idea. But Somalia's involvement in the council meant of another significant change in Ethiopia's foreign policy. Previously, this had been centered on constraining Ethiopian, uh, sorry, constraining Islamic extremism, supporting Amazon, Amazon in, uh, in Somalia, but also favoring Somali federal states, Jubaland, Puntland, and Somaliland, which is not a federal state, but uh, at the expense of the federal government in Mogadishu. This was aimed really to limit any possible threat from any resurgent nationalistic Somalia in the future. But now, since 2018, Ethiopia, along with Eritrea, is supporting President Mohamed Fomadjia and the federal government in Mogadishu. In effect, that actually mirrors what uh, Prime Minister Abiy wants to see in Ethiopia, a stronger central authority. And both Ethiopia and Eritrea do now appear to be supporting Fomadjia's efforts uh, to actually manipulate the electoral process in Somalia. The election is due uh, theoretically at any, well, it's overdue now, it should have taken place in February. That's, as it were, the plus side of the, uh, of the uh, council, of, of uh, the Horn of Africa Council. But it has concerned other members of ECAD. Djibouti, for example, is still at odds with Eritrea over a border problem at Rastumera. Kenya is at odds with Somalia over their maritime border and over Kenyan support for Jubilan and the Kenya's involvement in, in Jubilee. And neither Sudan nor Uganda have uh, welcomed it either. And in fact, the creation of the Horn of Africa Council th threatens to divide EGAD. Most serious element of all this at the moment, of course, is Sudan, which is currently embroiled with Ethiopia over the congested al Fashak border area. I don't want to go into any details about that now because I'm running out of time. But only two years ago, Abe had close relations with the Sudanese authorities. He helped to get talks started between the military and civilian elements after the overthrow of President Bashir. Sudan was firmly allied to Ethiopia in terms of the negotiations over the Gerd Dam, the uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Now it's aligned itself, now Sudan has aligned itself with Egypt in the tripartite negotiations. It's even held joint military exercises with Egypt which has assured Sudan of support over al Fashak, And this is certainly affecting the chances of getting an agreement in the discussions over the dam. The last round of talks was this week under AE auspices. They appear to have made no progress. And Egypt is expressing increasing frustration over Ethiopia's determination to launch the second filling of the dam in, in July, as is Sudan. There've even been claims surfacing in, in Khartoum that it's not only Al Fashak that belongs to Sudan, the disputed border area currently, where the conflict, some conflict is taking place, but Sudan, some Sudanese have also been claiming that the Gumu's inhabited area of Beni Shango further south along the border, and is, it, it belongs really to Sudan, the Gumu's live on both sides of the border. And this is an area, of course, which hosts the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And if Sudan is going to try and claim that, it will cause undoubted problems, to put it mildly. It's also perhaps relevant to notice this week that Uganda signed a security agreement with Egypt too, uh, possibly indicating a change in Ugandan policy towards the Nile Basin Initiative and any support for Ethiopia's position. There are, in fact, other changes in foreign policy arising out of the conflict in Tigray, uh, ranging from the deliberate encouragement of improved relations with Saudi Arabia and UAE, and I think a much more unintended but unfavorable effect on the way Abe and Ethiopia are now regarded by the US and in Europe. Uh, and this is something that's going to have to be taken into account by the government in, in Addis for quite some time to come, I think. But I think I've probably gone well beyond my time and it's now time for others to uh, say something. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Um, I'll move to our next speaker, Martin, please. The floor is yours. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much. And uh, my apologies for appearing as uh, Eritrea Focus, which I am not. Um, and I would ask the host not to uh, switch off my, my video again. Um, it, the, um, I, I'm going to try and deal in the, in the brief time I have left um, with, with three issues. The first is, I would suggest that the situation is the result of a series of calculations and miscalculations. Secondly, I'll go very briefly through the fighting and the aid situation, and finally onto the state of the um, current um, uh, diplomacy. Um, the, the calculations really come, uh, the miscalculations are on both the side of the Tigrayans and the, um, the Ethiopian government. The Tigrayans believed that they could uh, hold elections, which they were told they were not allowed to do um, by the central authorities. Because one of the interesting things is that both uh, Eritrea has never had elections. The Ethiopian government is way beyond its mandate and has no mandate to, to exist in. Uh, and the, uh, the Somalis, as Patrick was pointing out, also have gone beyond their mandate and therefore have no legitimacy. The one legitimate government, in fact, were the Tigrayans, because they held their own elections, despite being told that this was, they should not undertake this. Uh, but this certainly got up the nose of the Ethiopians and of uh, Prime Minister Abiy. The second thing they did was that they refused to allow the army to move its um, heavy ammunition, uh, heavy uh, armaments and ammunition away from the front line with Eritrea. They believed that there was a possibility there could be another conflict and how right they were. So the Northern Command retained its weaponry right on the border, which is where the Tigrayans believed it was necessary. And they did this by um, organizing mass protests to prevent the, it, its removal. The third issue that they, they made a miscalculation with in a sense was sending back the uh, newly uh, appointed commander of the Northern Command back to Addis Ababa just before the war began, saying that he was unacceptable. And clearly from, an, from, a, uh, you know, from a, the, the, the point of view of the, the center, this was a, a, a real a, you know, violation of, of their rights. So those were their mistakes. On, I think on the part of Prime Minister Abiy, his mistake was assuming that if he attacked um, in coordination with the Eritreans, uh, the Amhara, and the National Army, the Tigrayans would be incapable of responding. And uh, six months later, we, it is clear that the Tigrayans certainly can. I think that the Tigrayans were taken by, by surprise. They were not ready for, for the attack, although uh, until a few days beforehand, when it was clear that it was coming, and so that was, in a sense, there were, there were miscalculations on both sides. The one person who really calculated, in a sense, was President Isaias, who I think is the guiding hand behind what we see now. He began thinking about what kind of state he should have long before any of this took place. And the, I think the relationship that he built with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abiy was one in which he thought that they would, they would have a confrontation with the, with the Tigrayans. And there have been long suggestions of that he plans to have a federal structure with Ethiopia again. Now this can't be proved because of course there's, there's no freedom of information inside Eritrea, but there were suggestions that prior to the war, there was a senior meeting of all of, of uh, President Isaias' closest associates, um, outside of Asmara, and that they agreed with his suggestion that uh, the Ethiopian Navy would be given access to the Eritrean port, something the French have suggested they would help with, and that in due course, some kind of federal structure would be established. Uh, we'll see whether that is pr proved, proved to be right in the end, but that is what, what one hears. And that in a sense, he thought that this, this war would remove the Tigrayans, as Patrick pointed out, his enemies from way back, from way back from the 1970s, in fact, where he, he loathed them. Um, and for President, for Prime Minister Abiy, it was also an opportunity to crush uh, the Tigrayans, whom he thought, uh, you know, were, were behind all of his troubles. So for both of them, they operated and they brought in 
allegedly some Somali troops as well. So between the Somali, the Amhara, the Eritreans and the federal thoughts, they thought they would crush them. Now, what I'm going to try and do is, is show you um, briefly the, um, the state of the fighting that, that is, go that, that is uh, going on. Um, let me just see if I can do it. Here we are. So this is just a front page. Uh, this is the map of the current state of fighting as best as we can see it. The yellow areas, the areas controlled by the uh, Ethiopians and the Eritreans and the uh, pink and orange areas are the areas held by the Tigrayans or are contested. And you can see this, the, how serious the war is. Yes, there are north-south links and that the uh, Eritreans and the Ethiopians control large sections of the center and of the north and um, west, but the, the Tigrayans are far from being crushed. The origin of this map is Ethiopia maps, which uh, is, exists online. Uh, exactly who they are is not clear, but they seem to have a, a fairly good idea of where things are going on. And what I would particularly suggest you look at is the areas in the far north. So around what is marked Shirara, which is the, up towards the Badme Triangle, and the other one just south of the, the town of Senefe in the uh, east, um, so around Adigrat. And if you see those areas are clearly marked as under the control of, well, it so shows Eritrea and Ethiopia, but it's effectively under the Eritreans who control that whole area. Um, now look at this map, and this is a map of uh, the situation uh, at the end of February of what could be aid could be delivered to. Um, and in reality, you will see that the area around Badme and around what is called Zalambesa, which is the sort of area that, that I was pointing to earlier, the other area, uh, is inaccessible. And the real question is, why is it that the Eritreans are refusing to allow aid to be distributed in those areas, which are areas that they are controlling. And a quest, one of the questions for the aid community is, um, can they possibly get in through Eritrea rather than just through, um, through coming in through Ethiopia? It suddenly hasn't been tried yet as far as I know, but uh, it's something that could be considered. The last uh, point I want to make is just how serious this is. And I'm going to point to a quotation from US Institute of Peace, which was made uh, at the very beginning of the war. Uh, and it was made by Johnny Carsons, the former Secretary of State for, African, uh, for Africa in the US, and by Herman Cohen. And they point out that this could lead to dangerous vulnerability across the whole of the, of the Horn of Africa. And I think that is the really most serious issue that is facing the, the, the horn right now. And it is in a sense why uh, it has been so important that we, we see a uh, determination by the United States and the European Union to try to end the, the conflict. And it, it has really been quite stark how much President Biden and, and his Secretary of State have, how much energy they have put into a, uh, a conflict which after all is only of limited concern for the United States. Um, I think that they are aware of the danger of, for the whole region and of course with it um, the relationships with people like the Saudis and the UAE who are also involved in all of this, that is all of, all of, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the conflict now. Um, you will of course be aware of the, um, the, that um, Senator Coons was sent, a very close associate of uh, pr uh, President Biden, was sent to, um, e to Ethiopia and tried to negotiate a ceasefire and the withdrawal of the Eritrean forces. Um, eventually, after a, a, the idea of a ceasefire was rejected out of hand by um, Prime Minister Abiy, as were attempts by the African Union to mediate in this conflict, where he again refused to accept any mediation, said he was going to win this war and crush the, the Tigrayans. Um, but uh, they di he did eventually uh, finally agree that indeed the Eritreans were in, involved in the fighting and that they would leave. 
the suggestions we have now is that far from leaving, they are being either reinforced or rebadged, that they're being given um, Ethiopian uniforms and uh, they are just being integrated into the Ethiopian army, that certainly sections of the Eritrean forces are. Of course, one shouldn't forget that parts of, of the far north of, of uh, Ethiopia and Tigray actually are legitimately Eritrean because they, they were given to them by the Boundary Commission, which was established after the 1998-2000 war. So the areas like Badme from which Eritrea has no reason to leave. This brings us to the, uh, to the final element in all of this, which I just wanted to draw attention to, which is the role of Pekka Harvisto, the Finnish, Finnish foreign minister, who is currently on a mission to try to um, resolve these issues. And interestingly, he went to the UAE, he went to Saudi Arabia before he arrived in Addis Ababa. He also held meetings with the, um, uh, in Cairo with the Arab League. And really interestingly, what, he was, what he's been talking about is a link, he's trying to resolve all of the questions that Patrick raised at the beginning, not just the war in Tigray, but also the Nile Dam, and perhaps the, the Alpha Shaga issue. So is there a way that, that this can be resolved? Um, of course, it has to be resolved in a sense between the United States and the European Union without going through the, um, the Security Council, because at the Security Council, the Chinese and the Russians would be unlikely to develop things. We will know much more on the 19th of April when, the, when uh, Mr. Havisto is due to report to the Foreign Affairs Council of the European Union and perhaps we'll get some idea then whether this diplomatic initiative will succeed or whether we're in for a long, long war. And we should not forget that the last time there was a war um, in uh, that the Tigrayans were involved in, it began in 1975. It didn't end until 1991. And if that is what we're in for, then the future of, of Ethiopia is very grim indeed. And the, uh, the su suggestion or the prognosis by the Institute of Peace might of a collapse of the Ethiopian state becomes increasingly possible. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it there. As I say, please do not switch off my uh, um, video. Uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Martin. Uh, by the way, nobody can see your video when you're off, so don't worry about that. Um, so I would uh, give the leave the floor to our last speaker, uh, Silam, please. Silam? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Shall I? Switch? Yeah. Yeah. We hear you very well. All right. Okay. Um, I'll uh, start my video as well. Um, good afternoon. I will. I'll just um, go a little bit into focus um, uh, to focus on the um, on on Eritrea. Uh, I am Eritrean, and I uh, that's that's where my um, understanding of the whole situation comes um, comes from. And I think it's a very important focus as well. Patrick and Martin have done a good job of painting uh, the kind of the, um, the regional and also um, the wider global context of this. I, I really do believe that um, Eritrea and specifically President Isasa Ford, it plays a crucial role in this, in that um, he not only has he had an, uh, has he influenced the, um, the war itself currently, but also the, the, the regions, um, recent history. I will, um, I'll start from 2018, where um, President Isaias declared that um, he was going to accept the, the peace deal with uh, that Abiy Ahmed offered. And um, it was specifically on, on a specific day, a crucial day, it was Martyrs Day uh, in Eritrea, and he was making the, the the annual Martyrs Day speech and uh, central to his declaration was that the fact that it was game over for TPLF. And um, the reason why that was important was Eritreans um, and Eritrea have put up with quite a lot, quite a lot of un, you know, unimaginable situation. They, they were put in unimaginable positions. 
because we were um, in this no war, no peace situation and everything that was happening to Eritrea, which was, um, there was no elections, well, elections uh, um, haven't been held in Eritrea at all since independence, but the last time parliament met in Eritrea was in February 2002. Um, President Isaias arrested 11 of his top officials in uh, September 2001 because they, um, they demanded accountability for the, the war with Ethiopia in 1998 to 2000. Um, newspapers were shut, there was no other media outlets than the government um, affiliated media. Air trains were um, put under this um, uh, situation, you know, under the situation where every able-bodied Eritrean person, child, was uh, uh, required to finish uh, high school education at the age of 16, 17 to 18 uh, at the National uh, Service Training Center. Effectively, they become soldiers from that age. And, to, and there was no, it was an indefinite, it was open-ended. And all of this was because there was that no war, no peace situation. Ethiopia was a threat. TPLF had it in for uh, Eritrea. And it, it could only happen in the context of this perpetual enmity. And, uh, and so when the peace deal was accepted, and when uh, specifically when President Isas accepted it, it had to make sense in that, in, within that context. President Isas is, um, we have painfully come to, uh, to know as Eritreans, is somebody who is so focused to the exclusion of any other focus on what he wants to achieve. And at this point, uh, in his history, what he wanted to achieve was the demise of TPLF because he saw TPLF as um, as a cause of humiliation in, in 1998 to 2001, as a cause of the political uh, strife that he had in 2001, and also the you know what followed in the years between 1920 uh, and between 2000 and 2018, the sanctions, um, the isolation, uh, and, and all of that. So for, for him, TPLF was, uh, was the orchestrator of all of this. For Eritreans inside the country who don't have access to uh, information other than what is fed to them uh, from the government. Also, you know, there's no university, high school um, education is strictly controlled by the government. So the information that Eritreans have is that uh, TPLF is causing all the hardship inside Eritrea. So when uh, when it was game, you know, when he declared game over, uh, it was important for him to effect that, to make that, uh, uh, to to make that declaration um, a reality. And uh, in Ethiopia's situation, uh, it was uh, it was looking impossible, if you like, because uh, Ethiopia was a state. It had a parliament. Um, a, Abiy Ahmed was a Nobel Peace Prize recipient. There was uh, quite a lot at stake. So, it, it, you know, the, doing away with the TPLF wasn't as uh, straightforward as, as all of that. So uh, President Isas has been orchestrating this since, um, since that time, because it's important, you know, for all of what he's done to make sense, TPLF have to have to go. And he hasn't. He does. He doesn't. He doesn't care what price he pays for the um, the previous twenty years. He had practically gambled away the uh, an entire generation of Eritreans who have uh, who have been uh, subject to the indefinite national service, and everything was worth it. And 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 it still it's it still seems to be worth it and and so that brings me to the what he used who he used these are the the army that we talk about in uh tigray the army that we unfortunately talk about in relation to the uh crimes against humanity the rape the looting the burning down of factories and institutions the desecration of um religious ancient historic religious institutions this is uh, the national service army that has been recruited most of them from the age of as i said 17 18 some of them even younger we're finding out um, a lot of them would be forcibly recruited a lot of them would have spent 
pretty much their entire youth in in you know in those trenches or at the, uh, as national service recruits their education is very limited the information they've got is next to nothing other than the information that the government feeds them and the hatred um the animosity or the you know the the, the what the sentiments of Isaiah Safwerki is the policy in the country, basically, and this is what is fed to them, and this is what is maintaining the, you know, they're, that's what they're fighting against, they're fighting against what they've been told is, um, is the enemy of Eritrea, the cause of Eritrea's decline, the cause of Eritrea's uh, situation currently. I was listening to an interview by a 16 year old um, who has been captured, who's, uh, who's, uh, who, who was giving an interview to the TPLF uh, media outlet recently. And what he was saying was the, uh, that um, one, one of the things that they got told was that the TPLF spent the last 20 years building um, buildings, factories, and institutions, but, the, uh, but they, us, the uh, um, PFDJ, were building uh, people or people's brains, and so, yeah, and I believe that, I see that they built an army that would do anything for them, and unfortunately, they're using them to 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 make this happen. I um, we talked a lot about what the international community has been uh, um, ha has been doing, all the efforts that are undergoing. I believe that without dealing with uh, the Eritrea situation, without understanding the influence of Isaiah Safwerki and without uh, taking that into account uh, in a major way, we will not see ourselves out of this uh, predicament. Peace is the only, uh, you know, the only solution for that region. And particularly worrying is the uh, the cycle of violence, the cycle of violence, uh, you know, the, the, that comes from way back, uh, as Patrick was saying earlier on, but even in recent history, if we don't find a way where, uh, you know, the people of that region, the different ethnic groups, but that also between Eritrea and Ethiopia, if we don't find a way uh, that sees both of these countries come out of this, with a robust um, arrangement, with a, with clarity and with a peace deal that uh, tells the people what they can expect and uh, work towards that, makes the people of that region stakeholders in in their own peace, uh, in the peace that has come for them. We will not see ourselves out of this for a long time to come, and it will yeah has taken generations, and it will continue to do so. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Silan. Thank you to uh, the three panelists for a very interesting uh, uh, talks. Uh, we can now open the floor to the questions and comments. We have already several uh, questions and comments. Uh, let me uh, first of all specify that this event is being recorded, so, so I want to make it this clear to the, to the public. Um, so we have already several questions. Um, I will start uh, reading the questions loud to you and then you can answer accordingly. Uh, some of them arrived while we, you were still talking. So maybe then you covered some of those points already, but if you want maybe to elaborate uh, a bit more. So first question, uh, what is the status of and outlook for food systems markets and access in the short uh, and the, uh, in the short and medium term integrate who do you want to answer um whoever i mean this is an open question to the whole panel so martin if you want to go please well i'll just say what one thing which is which is obvious which is that yeah. the, the the situation in in tigray like in in many parts of ethiopia is is always precarious i mean many people do not produce on their farms sufficient to <clears throat> actually um keep them their families going for a full year and require food aid even in good years but the the worst part about the current situation is that the current fighting came just as the harvest was supposed to be coming in and much of it will have been lost. 
So uh, that's together with the looting that has been described, but, um, you know, it means that people are in an incredibly precarious situation. And one study that came out last uh, week suggested that between 50 to 100 people a day are already dying of starvation. Thank you very much. Um, of course, if anyone else wants to join or add something, uh, uh, feel free. I would move to the next uh, question. This is for Patrick. Um, recently, the spokesman of the Ethiopian MFA said that the Eritrean people did not celebrate independence. He then walked this back, but was this a true error or did it reflect a more widely held government view or even a trial balloon. Um, so he said, I know Patrick has told that his eyes are sometimes being equivocal about full independence for Eritrea. Well, I think the, the spokesman, no, uh, yes. I, th I think the spokesman obviously felt that he, he had overstepped Mark in some respect there. He said he did walk back from the statement. Uh, <clears throat> and it certainly is a, a view that would not be at all widely held, I think, in Eritrea. Um, with, in Ethiopia, there are those certainly who believe that it would be a good thing if Eritrea returned to um, Ethiopia, but they are a very small, <coughs> I think of now, a very small minority. Um, but there are a much larger element of, of Ethiopians who believe that it would certainly be uh, it's very satisfactory if, if Ethiopia, the largest uh, landlocked country in the world, was able to use ASAP freely or to have as to, to, to get ASAP. One of the criticisms made of uh, Mela Sinawe, <coughs> I'm sorry, at the end of the um, Ethiopian war in 2000 was that he had not made any effort to actually, or made a, not made a serious enough effort to capture ASAP and use it as a, at least as a bargaining counter or as for Ethiopia to keep it. But I don't think this represents the, the mass of, of, of Ethiopian uh, views. On the other hand, there's certainly, as, as Martin said, that there have been these suggestions that uh, President Asias would be interested in some sort of federal structure. And it is possible that um, a comment by the spokesperson was a trial balloon of some kind. In 2018, when Abby and um, Asias were meeting in, in Addis Ababa, when Asias came to Addis Ababa, <coughs> there were a number of comments about, we're all together, uh, Asias saying, I now defer to Abby as, as the head of the region and so on. Uh, and Abby has said that uh, when he was at Davos in January 2019, I think, that Ethiopia, Eritrea and uh, Djibouti, and it didn't really need to have separate armies. They should all have one army. Who was going to control it? He didn't actually mention. But um, so that there are ideas floating around. And Abby certainly has made it clear that he supports the idea of regional integration quite strongly. Um, this is something that comes out very strongly in, in his book, Medema. Uh, and there is a, uh, it's all part of the, the wider African Union move towards the unity, the, the unification of Africa, which is scheduled for 2063. <clears throat> so there are some suggestions in that direction, but it would certainly be, I think, premature at the moment. And I would think that, uh, that this could be no more than the very, uh, a very fragile trial balloon, if it was even that. Right, thank you very much. Uh, there is another question uh, for you, Patrick. Uh, do you think Abi could go to war with Sudan, Egypt as a way of diversion from the internal pressure he's facing, especially the tension between the Amara and Tigrayans and the Romans and Amara? It would be quite difficult, I think, for Ethiopia to go to war at the moment because of the fact that there is still a lot of conflict going on in in Tigray, among other things. Um, and Abby said the other day that there are eight fronts, uh, I think, uh, of conflict actually active in Tigray. And the Ethiopian army does appear to have problems or to have had problems because of what happened in Tigray. The issue of what happened to the Northern Command on the night of November the 3rd, um, 
and the difficulty that uh, Abiy has had, if you like, in, in dealing with uh, the issue in Tigray. Uh, the Ethiopian army was not, in, was not sufficient to, to resolve the problem from his perspective. Uh, the Eritrean army has had to be involved on a massive scale, and that still hasn't resolved the problem. Um, Ethiopia is said to have withdrawn some troops from uh, Amisom in, in Somalia, to, uh, or at any rate from active duty in Somalia in order to participate in Tigray, which again suggests questions about just how organized the army is. And indeed, since 2018, Abiy has carried out some fairly substantial uh, purges of the senior Tigrayan element within the army, um, and has talked a lot about the, the need to uh, restructure it and re redo its training and so on. Uh, which suggests that there's no real, there would be no real enthusiasm for any kind of conflict. And one of the reasons why the Sudanese may have taken this opportunity to uh, uh, to take over Al Fashak, for example, is, is simply because they are aware that Ethiopia is in really no position to go to war. The danger, though, is of course that uh, with Sudanese, with the Sudanese pushing, if you like, with Egypt prepared to support Sudan, and with the whole question of, uh, of Egypt's view of what should happen with the, with the, with the dam, with GERD, that there is a, it would be fairly easy for a conflict to arise, which neither side are actually in any, of any real enthusiasm, enthusiasm to have. Uh, I, I don't think Abiy would want to go to war with, with Sudan at the moment. And I don't think it would be very wise for him to do so. And I think all the statements that Ethiopia has been making have been actually less than, less provocative, not really provocative in that sense. They've been fairly moderate in, in tone. And I think Abiy would prefer to have a, a deal, but it's going to be difficult. Uh, thank you very much. Um, next question is about the British foreign policy in the, in the region, uh, if you each of the panelists can comment on UK foreign policy on Tigray, uh, whether or not this has been a failure, has ended up in a failure or successful, what should it be? Well, I, I, I can say something about it if, if you like. Um, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the in a sense, Britain has become far less uh, influential because of its Although it has a role on the UN Security Council, I mean, it, it was it was much more influential when it was part of the European Union. But the leaving the European Union and Brexit has left Britain with a far less important voice in the world. Um, I, you know, having said that, uh, Britain has taken, I suppose, what is its traditional role, which is to say, well, let's maintain links. Uh, yes, they have uh, quietly asked for the Eritreans to leave, and they have. Uh, suggested that that there should be a, um, an, a you know a resolution to the conflict, but it has been very much less public than the role that has been taken by the um, United States and by the European Union. And I, I suppose that is, in a sense, exactly what one would expect from from uh, the, the the Foreign Office, which definitely does not try and get involved in 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 things unless it is it has, absolutely has to. Thank you, Martin. Anyone else, Silam or Patrick, you want to add anything on this? Not really, no. I, I would agree that, uh, that the UK's influence and, and uh, in this sort of situation is, is, is really uh, not very, not very, um, not very real. Uh, it, it's, it's uh, if it is expressing its view, uh, this will be he heard, as it were. But I don't think there's very much it can do at this point. Thank you. Um, so another question for the whole panel. Uh, the former Soviet Union had a substantial involvement in Ethiopia during the Cold War. Is there any strong evidence that Russia is now getting involved diplomatically, militarily or economically in the Ethiopian conflict or generally speaking in the, in the Horn of Africa? Uh, same questions applies to China's possible involvement. Thank you. Do you want to do that, Martin? Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Patrick. <laughs> or, or, or to, 
<laughs> the question is for everybody. So. There, there, there are clearly uh, uh, Russian and Chinese interests in, in the region. I and mean, China, of course, has a, a military base in, in, uh, in Djibouti. Uh, and this is something that uh, worries, for example, the Americans quite substantially. Um, and there have been suggestions that uh, the Chinese, uh, the, the Americans would be quite interested in uh, possibly moving to Eritrea, moving their base to Eritrea to get out of, re get to remove Camp Le Monnier out of reach of the, of the Chinese. Um, the Russians have shown some interest in, in, in trying to set up, a, trying to have a base in, in Port Sudan, no, in uh, Suakim or Port Sudan, uh, originally under um, uh, President Bashir, and they've been also talking to uh, the uh, new regime more recently. Uh, they've also, uh, the foreign minister has also had meetings with the Eritrean foreign minister recently. Uh, neither have, I think, shown any a sign of, as it were, any active uh, role, but both have, uh, as Martin mentioned, both have um, taken a position in the uh, uh, in the Security Council, broadly speaking, supportive of uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe and and, uh, and Assas in terms of the Eritrean, uh, in terms of the Tigrayan situation, and there's no reason to suppose that they will change that. Uh, the, the general view of both is that uh, the Security Council should keep out of internal affairs of this kind, uh, and I would imagine they will continue to, to do that. Um, they have an interest. I mean, the Red Sea is becoming far more of a, a security issue in, the in, in international terms, um, partly because of the whole issue of uh, Iran and uh, relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, or Iran and the Gulf. Uh, and both are continuing to uh, take, will, will continue to take a, a, an interest, undoubtedly. Uh, but neither, I think, appear to be actively involved in, in, in uh, the internal politics at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, next question, if you uh, can discuss uh, any of you, uh, the Amara genocide. I don't know, Salam, if you want to comment or... Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that worries me about what's been going on in the, in, in the region in this war and what's been going on in Ethiopia since, um, you know, for, for the last three years is the fact that the, the num you know, the, the, the cruelty with which people have uh, been dealing with each other and uh, addressing their concerns and being, you know, making their concerns known. And uh, part of that is uh, has been the uh, killing of uh, Amhara that have Amhara people have settled in different parts of Ethiopia, other than uh, other than the Amhara region. And uh, and 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 that that is um, as worrying as the um, the the genocide against uh, Tigrayans as well, and 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 it is what what um, what's what is at stake for Ethiopia here. The the fragmentation of Ethiopia becomes visible uh, when you know when things like this uh, can happen, and it's not just. Uh, the Amhara. It's it's also uh, the Oromo that 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 also claim that they are being uh, treated with the same. You know, the Oromo genocide is also something that 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 Oromo people complain about, and and so on and so forth. So there is something deeply worrying about what's happening in Ethiopia and how grievances are being dealt with and how uh, weak. This, the system has become, um, and, and and yeah, and and I think it's it's um, it's the influence of what has been going on and how things haven't been dealt with at at, at junctures when they should have been dealt with. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so I'm trying um, to. Uh, uh, cover sometimes uh, several questions all together if they are on the on the same topic. So um, I just want to make the public aware that sometimes I, I'm just uh, putting together different questions on the same topic. So um, if I'm not reading correctly uh, your question, it's because I'm just trying to 
uh, you know, put together different questions on the same topic in order to cover as much as possible, uh, considering that we have a limited time. Um, okay, so uh, we have um, just one moment. We have a question for Patrick and Martin um, in terms of uh, um, the reconciliation of two uh, different interpretations. On the one hand, uh, Isaias is fiercely committed to guarding Eritrean independence. On the other, uh, there is this concept of a bigger federation confederation in which Eritrea and Ethiopia wouldn't come together uh, again. Uh, so how if you can elaborate a bit on, on this? Of this type of this kind of uh, um, um, opposition or contradictions between these two different uh, views. Well, it, 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 on, on the face of it, it is uh, it is extraordinary because uh, one shouldn't forget that uh, President Desais did lead the the Eritrean struggle, uh, you know, for the best part of thirty years, um, which led to independence. So why on earth would somebody with that kind of background then consider? Um, anything that, that reduced Eritrean uh, sovereignty or independence, it would seem contradictory. And yet, as Patrick pointed out, when he went to um, Addis Ababa the first time after uh, when peace uh, broke out in 2018, he then started talking about, you know, you are my leader, he says to, uh, to Prime Minister Abiy, and uh, there are all these suggestions that perhaps federalism is back on the agenda. And I think if you have to, if you look behind what is happening, you begin to understand it because um, President Isaias has always seen himself as the uh, primus inter pares, to use a, a, a Latin phrase, that he was by far and away the most important influence in the whole of the region. And the fact that he leads a nation of perhaps, you know, four million, five million people, and there are far more in, in, in Ethiopia, has never stood in his way. And he sees himself as really running the show uh, behind the scenes. And uh, I mean, for example, he warned Mela Zanawi many years ago uh, when the Tigrayan leader was still uh, running Ethiopia. He said, if you ever you know, come up against us, you will see you will be in huge trouble. Your, 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 your uh, hold over Ethiopia will collapse. And so the idea that, that he would go for federation is not that, not that impossible. Uh, but of course, it will probably be a federation that he thinks that he can control, not one in which he would um, personally be uh, necessarily the, the leader, but the, there are ways of, of, that he would have of manipulating the situation from rear. And that is, in a sense, one of the perceptions that he has portrayed for many, many years is of the, the, the uh, you know, eminence grise of the, of, the, of, of the Horn of Africa. And, uh, you know, he certainly has outlasted many, many other leaders. And uh, whatever one thinks of him and, uh, you know, the dictatorial regime that he leads, he certainly has uh, had a long foresight, great foresight and great ability to um, see things in the long term and sacrifice short term gains in the, to achieve that. I think it might also be worth mentioning that um, in the sense that back in the 1990s after the independence, the jure independence of Ethiopia of Eritrea in 1993, Eritrea played a, a very African role uh, Asias, uh, or the, the Eritreans were, prov were providing uh, training, arms training to, in Congo. They were involved uh, militarily in Sudan, and they were also providing training to, to, in Chad. And Eritrea certainly saw Asias, and Eritrea certainly saw himself as being an important, very important player in, in Africa. This didn't stop him being extremely critical of uh, uh, of um, the African Union, for example, uh, and I, I think Martin's right in the sense that uh, if he if he's going to involve himself in in uh, uh, in any multinational organisation, it is one it is only if he is in a position to essentially control what is happening. If he thinks that he's that Eritrea is getting a a bad deal, as it were, he will walk out immediately. Uh, but if he thinks that it's something that he can, in effect, control or take a senior position in, 
then there is no problem about Eritrea's involvement. Thank you very much. Um, another question for Martin. Do you expect this will spill over into a regional reconfiguration, particularly the Balkanization of Ethiopia, as many have predicted? Um, it seems like Ethiopia is going to return into a conflict every generation, basically. I certainly hope not. But uh, if I may, could I uh, uh, suggest that it's perhaps something that Salam would like to uh, respond to? Just because I, you know, I, I think she, you know, after all, is from the region, has lived a long time in, although in Eritrea, has lived a long time in Ethiopia, and I think is in the better position to, to comment. Yeah, one of the thanks, Martin. One of the worrying trends is precisely that the the um, uh, you know. To, to personalize it a bit, I've got lots of Tigrayan friends who were um, very proud of being Ethiopian. Uh, very, um, Ethiopia is a significant and important part of their identity, has been a very significant and important part of their identity. And uh, that has been completely eroded now. They have become, in the last five, six months, they have become, they have transformed themselves into, uh, you know, in, in, they have begun envisaging uh, an independent state uh, and they, they're no longer, they don't consider themselves Ethiopians. They have been um, done hard by everything that has happened. I've got, of course, the, uh, we, we all uh, have come across the uh, Oromo struggle for, for, for so long and even that has you know in 2018 uh, there was a hope that with uh, with an Oromo uh, in 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 uh, in the helm of power maybe some of their grievances would be addressed maybe they would finally uh, begin to uh, feel stakeholders of this uh, 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 centralized Ethiopia well this notion of Ethiopia but um, I mean the Ethiopia as an empire state that has got to be dismantled has become a very strong uh, rhetoric amongst the Oromos. The, the, in the rest of Ethiopia, of course, the um, the the marginalization has has long you know has been long standing uh, with the southern nationalities, with the Somalis, with the Afaris. Uh, so the, that that um, that that stakeholdership has uh, has been quite fragmented for a long time but even with the uh, with the strongest um, elements of the union which is the Amhara the Oromo and the Tigrayans already we see the loosening of uh, the Oromos and the Tigrayans. Thank you very much. There are also several questions concerning the um, attention of the international community. What's the degree of the attention that the international community is devoted, devoting to this uh, uh, crisis, what we can expect in the future as well. Uh, and for instance, if there are any chances that a case being compiled and brought forward to the ICC. Well, let me have a go at that briefly, and then perhaps Patrick. Uh, it could only be referred to the to the ICC by the the UN Security Council, and I, you know, because the, it hasn't gone through an individual state, and I see no indications that the Security Council is about to do that. So I think that is unlikely. Um, I think that we are at an extremely important moment because uh, the. Let's be honest, there are so many crises in the world. I mean, there's a brewing one in Ukraine. There's one in Myanmar. Uh, there's the ongoing war in Syria. The Horn of Africa will only get a limited period, a limited window of opportunity when it really has the, uh, the attention of the world. And let us not forget that a few years ago, Darfur was the cause which everybody was concerned about. Film stars, pop stars, they all went there. Who mentions Darfur now? The situation is still as bad as it ever was, as far as I can see, or at least not very much improved, and nobody cares. And so, if, frankly, unless there is a rapid development and settlement of this, then it will just be left to rot, and the war will continue unless the Ethiopians and the Eritreans manage to crush the Tigrans. There's no suggestion at the moment that they are going to, but if they do, then that would 
finish the war. Other than that, we will just be left with yet another localized conflict, which Africa has to live with uh, and draining Eritrea, draining Ethiopia and draining the region and putting these tremendous strains on the whole of Ethiopia. And that is the real danger. There's only limited attention from the world and it will soon be over. Thank you, uh, Salam and, and Patrick. Do you want to add anything or anything to add on the international communities? Well, the, the, the international community only does act when it thinks there is, is uh, it's in its interest to act and that there is reason to do so. And given the, dif the differences in the, uh, in the Security Council uh, on what is happening, uh, and in Ethiopia and Eritrea, and uh, as Martin says, there are a number of other uh, problems around. Not, not least one he didn't actually mention, which I think was Yemen, might have been mentioned. Um, there is a the humanitarian side of things is something that does take people's attention rather more uh, than anything else. One of the difficulties with any situation like this is that there is a massive amount of material that comes out on, or comments that come out on, on social media. They're very difficult to evaluate. And the, certainly there have been these allegations of, of killings on, and abuses on all sides, as it were. But uh, it, it's very difficult to persuade people to act uh, and it's very difficult to see what exactly they can do anyway if they are interested in acting. I mean, as we mentioned earlier the question of whether the UK has any interest, has any uh, influence that can bring to bear, and the answer to that is absolutely none. In terms of it, it can complain. Uh, the uh, one of the things that was very evident, I think, in, in terms of the international response to the uh, original. Uh, problem, uh, the, the fighting that started in Tigray in, in November, uh, was that uh, there has been a consistent amount of concern or deep concern expressed by Europe and America, uh, the United States. Uh, and as some, several commentators have made the point, you know, the concern is not very helpful to what's happening in terms of the humanitarian problem. You can, uh, it may satisfy you to, to uh, satisfy the government of, say, the UK to express deep concern, but it doesn't do anything at all. And that, I think, is, is, is a problem. It's one of the issues that uh, really the, the uh, African Union from time to time does consider. Uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, I think, not irrelevant to notice that uh, 2020 was a specific year in Africa, the year when the I think the year to bring the, the uh, to silence the guns um, and the amount of effort that was put into that in theoretical terms, in, in terms of the discussions in the AU and in terms of the uh, African Union Peace and Security Council were considerable. It didn't actually do very much in terms of, of silencing the guns. This is something that is extraordinarily difficult to do. It, it, it's something, in fact, of course, though, that is not the business, in fact, in many ways, of, of the outside world. This is something that is, uh, African uh, leaders make a lot to the two of African solutions for African problems. Certainly, that is what ought to be carried out. It is not the business, or should not be the business, really, or should not have to be the business of the international community. This is an issue for Ethiopia and Eritrea. It's not, I mean, we can make, outsiders can make some comment and they can offer advice if they like, but it, it is for the people involved to resolve the problem, not us. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question for Patrick, if you can please say more uh, about how the Horn of Africa Council is a threat to the Intergovernmental Authority of, on Development. Threat is perhaps the wrong word to have used, um, but it does uh, offer an alternative uh, or appears to be moving in that direction. Uh, I mean, IGAD is uh, involves all the countries of the region apart from Eritrea. 
which walked out in 2007 and hasn't returned, uh, despite the peace deal with with, uh, uh, with Ethiopia in 2018. There were quite widespread uh, expectations in 2018 that Eritrea might come back into the uh, into EGAP. It's shown absolutely absolutely no interest in doing so, and indeed, rather than do that, it has set up the Horn of Africa Council, uh, and that involves three of the seven members of EGA, or, or if you count Eritrea, eight members of EGA. Um, so, and if, and if South Sudan is brought into it, which I think the council is looking to do at the moment, then you, will, you are in fact using up half the uh, elements in, 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 in EGA. It doesn't mean to say that they are going to withdraw from EGA, but their, their attention, if you like, is distracted or their involvement is liable to be distracted. There's been a, a lot of consideration over the last few years about how far EGAD needs to be uh, restructured and reorganized anyway. And um, back some years ago, I, I remember some papers floating around in, in Addis Ababa about the question of expanding EGAD to, you know, or reorganizing it to incorporate the East African community or vice versa or trying to bring the two together in some respect. The, at the moment, EGAD is, is uh, the regional economic community for Eastern Africa uh, within the AU and it has a, a function, an AU function in that respect. And there's no reason to suppose it, it, it will collapse as, as yet. But the fact of the matter is if you're setting up a, a, an alternative uh, organization, and if it is going to be an organization and a structure provided and so forth, then it is going to weaken EGAD. It's going to have an effect on, on EGAD. Um, and as I say, the, there's some questions about how far EGAD needs to be reorganized and restructured and so forth anyway. So there is a the possibility of, of replacing EGAD in that, in that sense. And, I, and I'm sure that has been under some sort of consideration. But whether it's whether uh, it's likely to, to achieve that, I'm not so sure. As I say, half uh, half the other countries, the other countries in, in EGAD seem to be less than enthusiastic and have problems with those that are already in the Horn of Africa Council. So uh, it, it, it it merely weakens the the coherence of of the of the, of the Horn of Africa, which I think is a, is a is a, is a pity. Thank you very much. Um, we have a series of three questions. Um, first of all, what are the chances that the Security Council will pass a resolution on cessation of hostilities and then set up a commission of inquiry for the human rights abuses in the in Tigray? Um, what are the possibilities, the chances that the Tigrayans can invoke Article 39 and break away from Ethiopia and form a de facto state? And in this case, what position the international community would take, and whether Ethiopia is ready to run free, fair, and credible, and credible elections on the 5th of June? Yeah. These, I guess, are open questions to uh, Sila. Maybe you All want right. to see. I'll, I'll stick my neck out to start with slightly. Um, in terms of how far the uh, election is going to be credible in, in June. Uh, this will depend to a considerable degree on, on security in, in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and the insecurity element is, is, is not confined currently to uh, Tigray. There is quite a lot of insecurity elsewhere. And there have been these allegations of, of killings and so on in several other areas of the country. And it is, if you're going to have a credible election, you do need to have as much security as possible. Uh, how far the National uh, Electoral Board of Ethiopia currently thinks the situation is, is uh, satisfactory in security terms, I'm not really sure, but certainly there have been problems. Um, the uh, part of the other aspect of it is that it doesn't really matter um, what the results will be, there will be people who will actually complain uh, that it is not going to be a free and fair election. It's irrespective of probably of whether it is a free and fair election. Those that are opposed to Abbey will certainly maintain that it is not. 
there are going to be some difficulties with it because the, there have been a number of arrests of Romo, uh, part, part, leading Romo politicians uh, last year uh, on various charges um, connected with the killing of, uh, or, or the killing of a, an Romo singer, Charlie. Uh, and there have been other issues that have led to difficulties with some of the parties. But the National Election Board certainly seems to be, uh, seems to think that it can currently go ahead. So there will be, I think, an election on, on uh, June the 5th. I would expect Abbey's Prosperity Party to win it. Um, the one area where probably there won't be an election will be in, in, in Tigray, I think. That looks as though the uh, security problems was unlikely to have succeeded by then. But, you know, it, it's still two months, two months away. Things may change. Um, what were the other parts of the, uh, of the question? Or should we leave them to uh, Salam to pick up? Yeah, maybe if you want to, to say something, add something. I was only going to add on the election anyway, and most of them yeah. have said, and again, it's it's not just the security issues, uh, it's it's who is not participating. Obviously, um, there won't be an election in Tigray. Of course, um, Tigray had its own election, and it was um, it was visibly a popular election. Um, but putting that aside, uh, this uh, Oromo leaders are uh, in prison and uh, two parties, two major parties have pulled out officially. Uh, and so they, if, if we're talking about stakeholdership, uh, a, a large swath of the Oromo population will not feel represented. There's a lot of contestations when it comes to um, Addis Ababa and uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the arrest of um, with, with continuing uh, imprisonment of Spender uh, Naga, there is this, a lot of questions that have been raised. Uh, there is questions about the parties that are uh, running, which are, um, which are more often than not seen to mirror what the Prosperity Party uh, is is saying, which makes it, uh, you know, which which leads a really. Um, disappointing discussions that are being had on serious major issues uh, that, that are happening and, and also a quite severe uh, um, situations in uh, in uh, in the Afar region where there is difficulties with the Somali region where um, borders have been moved and there's contests around where things should be. So I don't see any um, any region Apart perhaps from the uh, Amhara region, where uh, where people would have would be would feel like they're electing anything. Uh, so so regardless of the outcome, it will be, it will make it very it will not give um, the kind of legitimacy to Abi that uh, we had hoped it would be possible in twenty eighteen. The only thing I would add to that is that. Uh... This is unlikely to trouble uh, either Africa or the uh, the wider community because, uh, quite frankly, Africa has been perfectly happy to have uh, utterly rig rigged elections in Uganda, and uh, nobody has suggested that uh, the Ugandan elections should be ignored. So, I don't think there's going to be any change. Just on the question of uh, sovereignty for Tigray, I think there are enormous barriers in the way of that um, becoming an independent state, whatever the constitution says. Um, the African Union hates new states uh, being being carved out of out of its territory. It took uh, the Eritreans 30 years to fight for theirs. Um, and the last one, if I got remember correctly, that was you know officially recognised apart from South Sudan was of course the Sahrawi, um, which the Moroccans loathe and detest. And uh, so you know it, it, this is not a process that people really want to see, especially in people when you have people like the Nigerians who haven't forgotten the, B the Biafra war. So there are, you know, a lot of obstacles in the way of, of that coming about. And I think it would be enormously difficult. One might also add that it, it's uh, unlikely to be a very serious proposition in the sense that uh, Tigray would be a landlocked state, an independent Tigray would be a tiny landlocked state. And it's dif difficulties of dealing with as it would stand at the moment, two enemies, Eritrea and Ethiopia, which are the two countries that surround it, would make it almost an insoluble problem. 
in that sense. It's worth actually mentioning in this context, though, that the Horn of Africa appears to be the one region of Africa which likes the idea of having um, a multiplicity of states. It isn't just South Sudan, which has um, been uh, able to successfully with break away. Eritrea, of course, was the other one. Um, Somaliland may not have been recognized, but it has actually managed to survive for since 1991. And uh, the question of, of state structures in, in, in the Horn of Africa obviously needs to be to, to have some additional consideration, perhaps. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid time is over, despite the fact that I have on the chat more than 40 questions, and I'm very sorry we uh, have no time to answer all of them. We try to you know, combine them, we try to answer as many as possible. I'm very sorry uh, we cannot uh, we cannot uh, uh, keep going answering all of them, but uh, time is over. Uh, so I would uh, kind of uh, um, ask for a virtual round of applause for our speakers to thank them for this very interesting debate. I thank all the participants for your comments and questions and for your uh, participation. Uh, thank you very much uh, and uh, well enjoy the weekend thank you very much and thank you to our speakers again thank you thank you bye bye goodbye goodbye